Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution, digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct-by-construction, concurrent, scalable solution our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. So a couple of years ago, um, when I was in Poland, I gave a talk about... Um, towards a living world. Um, and the idea was to give um, a, a computational account of, um, you know, so, some of what is entailed by biological agency. And what I settled on were two properties, metabolism and reproduction. Uh, and uh, I gave a, you know, a sort of a toy Rolang model of that. Um, and then I pointed out that the, with those two properties, you got something that looked remarkably like um, the core of a Casper validator. Uh, and, you know, sort of walk through um, the correspondences. Uh, and, you know, the the interesting point is that that the you know we didn't have a uh you know, there wasn't a goal to model casper right there was a goal to model um a biological agency um and then i and i made a, a few points uh which had to do with um you know when when we're modeling things like um, uh, uh, when we're working with with certain abstractions like physics um, there's no life in physics uh, life ends up being an emergent property uh, in from the physical perspective or at least in you know the, in modern physics and the idea that somehow the living world is, uh, that the physical world is barren of life is is I think at the heart of much of or, or sorry not the physical world but the, the physical um, principles are barren of life um, is is a kind of conceptual mistake uh, and I, I wanted to argue that that um, you if you get uh, if you if you get it, the principles right, then life shows up much earlier um, in the stack, so to speak. Um, now, I recently stumbled across um, a, a talk that Eric Smith gave at the Santa Fe Institute. And in his, um, uh, and, and and there's a book associated with the talk and it's called the, the origin and nature of life on earth. Now, now I can't, I mean, his, his talk was like a good, it, it was over an hour long. And um, so I'm, I'm not gonna do justice to that, uh, but I will give a kind of cartoon summary. Uh, and, uh, you know, es essentially his argument is that geochemistry driven to states that are far from equilibrium um, because of A, the sun, and B, the planetary formation um, will eventually produce life, right? So that, you know, you, you, you get a, it, it's not accidental. Uh, so despite Francis Crick's comments to the contrary, 
uh, and, uh, and other scientists comments to the contrary about the unlikely nature of life. Um, they, uh, 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 Eric Smith and his co-author argue that in fact, life is much more inevitable. Uh, and he, he argues that, that we have to view life from a whole systems perspective. So he looks at it as the, the fourth geosphere. So you have the, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the biosphere. Uh, and that, that uh, uh, shifting the perspective from you know, individual living organisms uh, to the entire biosphere is the right perspective. Um, and, uh, and as a, you know, one articulation of the, uh, you know, one refinement of this kind of Cartesian characterization of, of Smith's um, uh, argument is that at a minimum, what you get uh, in this uh, sort of march towards life in, from geochemistry that is far from equilibrium um, is uh, 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 metabolic processes. And his and one of the points that he observes is that uh, metabolic processes are remarkably the same in all living organisms. That, that you know, there's this core process that is the same uh, across all life on Earth, uh, and I was I was really shocked. Uh, I hadn't realized that uh, that metabolism was you know effectively the same, uh, and um, and you know because I ha I had you know, really from first principles uh, reasoned towards, um, uh, reasoned, you know, that, that metabolism and replication were the, were two essential properties of life. Um, and, and, you know, this, this really had to do with, you know, how do, how do you give computation a form of agency that, uh, that, uh, you know, um, will ultimately uh, slot it into um, a, a natural selection process and metabolism and replication are, are two of those properties that, that seem essential uh, ultimately to fit into a natural selection style agency. Now, one of the things that's really remarkable to me though is that that differentiates the computational perspective from um, the biospheric perspective um, is that if you can give a completely computational account of something like metabolism, uh, then uh, and and and. You know, there's there's a reason why one might think it is possible to do that, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, but if you could do that, then um, uh, you, you can lift Smith's argument from geochemistry, right? It you know, so so there's, there's something valuable and important about the perspective, of the the sort of situated perspective um, that he's taking. Uh, which is, you know, it's, it's very practical. It relies on an evidentiary uh, chain that, you know, comes from whatever we can gather from, uh, from the, the uh, record and the uh, left behind on earth by life uh, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, it makes for good science and, and the perspective uh, is, sane and rational in the sense that, you know, <clears throat> at least all the life that is heterotrophic, um, meaning, you know, depends on other life and, uh, for, um, <clears throat> for metabolic um, sustenance. Uh, <clears throat> you know, th that's all interconnected, right? There's a, it's a giant, it's a giant dependency graph that, 
um, pretty much spans the entire biosphere. I mean, there are some autotrophic life forms, I guess, but by and large, what you're looking at is a giant um, dependency graph um, <clears throat> uh, that that makes life, um, uh, you know, sort of into one big bundle. <laughs> So, that, so there's a, a, a good reason for thinking about it, you know, in situ. Um, but uh, the, the extent to which you can lift it from the situation to a computational account is the extent to which you can use by similarity to, to gaze out into other contexts and other situations, uh, physical situations, and um, observe the same, you know, processes which might be, which we might also consider either metabolic or, you know, uh, living. Um, and, um, you know, so for example, you know, who's to say that with the right, with the right lens, we don't find, um, we don't find things that we call living processes uh, in a star. Uh, or the, the chemistry of a star. I mean, maybe it's not there, but but the fact is we can we can kind of use um, by simulation as like a, a microscope or a telescope, right? It it you can you can think of it as sort of like X-rays, in in the sense that you know we can we can gaze out, uh, um, you know, in in the same way that we, we couldn't see in uh, you know through the skin of uh, living creatures, of vertebrates, for example, uh, um, be prior to being able to, um, to uh, take X images using x-rays. Uh, similarly here, by, by simulation allows you to sort of see through or into the nature of processes um, and, and, and thus, you know, notice when things are 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 um, the same somehow uh, and <clears throat> and that that would that would allow us to to look for life outside of the kinds of contexts and situations that we had uh, originally suspected uh, life might might be so so in, in particular one of the places that that you know I have for, for uh, well over a decade um, suspected that we might find life. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm sure this gets me labeled as, as a, a, a nutcase. But um, if you look at all the different proposals for quantum gravity, one of the things that stands out is that it, it forces... Um, space-time itself to be computationally complete, you know, in, in the same way that, you know, well, we can build the universal quantum computer. Well, if you marry space-time and quantum mechanics together in a successful way, then space-time itself becomes uh, something where you can host a universal computer. And once you can host a universal computer, then it becomes at least possible in principle. Uh, I'm not saying that we, we have evidence thereof, but it is possible in principle to now build processes that you know, uh, have the complexity or the, the arrangements the by, by similar to, to um, metabolism and replication and, and other properties that we might um, reasonably associate with life. Uh, and so in, in this sense, one can think of um, the, the actual fabric of space-time uh, as something that is uh, potentially uh, alive. Uh, and, and what this does is it puts a kind of um, quantitative uh, predictive framework uh, around um, proposals that uh, Christopher Alexander makes in The Nature of Order. So, so he argues that, that life is a property of space. Uh, and and uh, 
if if you read his work, um, he he's arguing that this is objective, and you know, um, and, and while his statement is qualitative, um, uh, it, it is not intended to be uh, solely metaphorical. You know, it, it's not a whimsical statement by um, you know a world class architect. Uh, he he is it's clear that he's attempting to bring mathematical tools uh, to the idea in such a way as to, uh, as to, you know, make it um, clear, uh, but he, he, he never crosses the, the line where it goes from a qualitative statement to, to a quantitative one in, in, in the sense that one can, can calculate uh, and and see that, in fact, there you know there is a, a kind of biosphere um, that is associated with with space itself. Uh, but uh, here we're we're talking about um, uh, we're, we're we're talking about a, a set of tools that uh, are unique to the computational perspective that allow us to look into the physical world and, and ask uh, questions and, you know, and test uh, the ideas of someone like Christopher Alexander. So let, let me stop there and see if this is making sense. Yeah, this is like completely mind blowing. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm, yeah, I'm following yeah. the, the 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 general train of thought. Cool. So this so this means that uh, maybe we have some 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 very large uh, life forms in the universe, uh, we, and we cannot see it right now because that's right. You know, like exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we, we right. We, yeah. Yeah. And and and, and it's, it's kind of a natural thing to. Um, it's a natural progression in the sense that, you know, Smith is saying, stop looking at individual organisms as the only way to investigate life and, and look at the biosphere and, and look at it from, you know, these, these various angles that he's, he's proposing. So one of the, one of the tools that, that he looks at is phase transitions. Um, in, you know, in, in regimes that are far from equilibrium. Uh, and, 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 you know, he applies um, notions of stability and error correction uh, in, in this setting. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, he has a very interesting story to tell, but the, the point is that he's kind of widened the perspective. Um, and I, I think that that's a, that, you know, uh, that you can actually widen the perspective further. So, so let me let me return to um, what a comment that I made at the beginning. If you stare at the periodic table from the perspective of a computer scientist, um, uh, what it looks like is a big rewrite system, right? You, you've got a bunch of you've got a bunch of computational um, agents, all of the elements. And uh, the elements have internal structure, uh, i.e. Their, their nuclear structure, um, that uh, gives rise to um, a, a host of rewrite rules. You know, for example, uh, sodium and chlorine um, interact with each other through electron uh, um, you know, sharing or, or, or exchange. Uh, and uh, and you, you get uh, salt. Right, so Na plus Cl uh, rewrites to salt. Um, so, so from a computational and 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 you know, um, uh, I mean, one of the one of the big insights in the last uh, twenty years uh, was uh, the work of Ahudi Shapiro and and picked up by many others, Luca Cardelli, um, Regev Aviv, and many others um, who. Who showed that with a stochastic version of the pi calculus, you can uh, um, faithfully model 
um, uh, chemical, biochemical, and biological um, interaction. Um, and, uh, and, and so this idea that, um, you know, it's the geochemistry um, in far from equilibrium states that gives rise to life. Well, I mean, when, when, you, when you lay that side by side with the work of Shapiro and others, you begin to see, well, it's, it's not actually so far-fetched that you could model, uh, you could model um, the chemistry and hence the biochemistry um, in this way and begin to get an account of, of a computational view of what is life. Uh, so that's, um, the, uh, that, you know, it, it, that, that gives us a little bit more, uh, a little bit more to, to hang our hat on, so to speak. And then um, the other thing that is interesting and goes, goes to comments I was making before I pressed the record button. So the, the, um, uh, I, I was recently talking with a friend of mine. Uh, he, he's a musician friend who sort of left his career um, in general relativity um, because physics has been moribund since the 1980s. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, it just hasn't changed. There hasn't there haven't been you know real uh, uh, exciting advances at least at least from his perspective. And I, I think. You know, Lee Smolin and other very, very reputable physicists, you know, make a similar claim. So, so anyway, I was I was describing to him uh, the the research program of discrete differential geometry, which I've only just discovered. Um, and uh, and he was he was making a comment that was very similar to the one I was observing, which is well. This is very intuitive, and it looks like the sort of thing that you would, um, uh, you would, you would uh, write down if you wanted to do a kind of intuitive quantum gravity. Um, and you know, I, I agreed with them that it had, you know, it it had that kind of promise that it was that you know it looked like one could do, you know, something along those lines, you know. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, um, <clears throat> but what I pointed out uh, that he he wasn't aware of because he, he you know he doesn't study computation uh, is that you know using the me the same kind of methods that I used um, with the, in modeling the Fano plane, um, you can you can easily turn the kind of uh, wire meshes. Um, that they use in um, in discrete differential geometry into process models. Um, so there's a there's a there's a an algorithm or a functor uh, which will go from which will take you from the uh, the world of discrete differential geometry to the world of the process calculi uh, and. <clears throat> Uh, but then once you've expressed, and one of the points I, I make in the, in the model of the Fano plane is that um, the Fano plane, you know, you, 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 have some, you have some interesting choices. You know, you can sort of have the, the Fano plane just kind of uh, just flash into existence for a moment and then the process evolves and, and there, you can no longer find the Fano plane structure. Or you can make it stable because you recurse in um, uh, you have the you have the structure be recursive, so you you revisit and revisit the same state over and over again. Um, and I use the same trick in the zero knowledge, um, uh, the ZKP um, work that I was talking about when I modeled the 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 graphs, um, the you know the three colorable graphs. So this same same idea where you know um, the 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 process keeps evolving and every time every time it revisits the state which is which uh, can be shown to be um, isomorphic to the graph. Um, uh, so, but but you can relax that property so that it doesn't get back to um, the original state. Uh, and, uh, and and what happens then is that 
the graph or the wire mesh starts to evolve in time. Uh, and this is uh, um, at the heart of what's going on, or, or, or how do I say this? This, this is a, an analog of the kind of thing that goes on in general relativity. Uh, so, so now you think of the wire mesh as um, a, a quantum space-time, and you, uh, and then the, and, and then to to fulfill the intuitions of Einstein's equations, um, that space-time has to change um, in response. Of, in, in particular, the the metric tensor is going to have to change what 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 is close to what will change um, as a result of the stress energy tensor okay so the stress energy tensor is telling us how uh, matter and energy is distributed throughout this wire mesh uh, and as a result of the matter and energy this space time is going to uh, reconfigure itself because there's this kind of mutual recursion between the stress energy tensor and the metric tensor um, uh, but but you have the capability to change the mesh smoothly and nicely um, because if you have expressed it as a row calculus process. So you can arrange it so that the evolution of the process um, al aligns with um, the directives of the uh, stress energy tensor, which then informs the metric tensor so that will shift where the matter and energy is located um, and then you can uh, which will then um, uh, you know uh, again change the metric tensor right so you get this this recursive loop um, uh, happening but you can you can write it down um, in, in at least potentially you can write it down and this was the insight that I had ages and ages ago um, was that, that there seemed to be uh, there's, there seemed to be a, a path um, uh, uh, to beginning to realize um, the quantum gravity stuff in, in this setting. Um, uh, but at the time, I, I didn't have the tools of discrete differential geometry. Uh, and now that I have them, um, there is a, there, you know, this, this um, research program seems a lot more solid, or at least there's, it's more likely that <clears throat> that we have have all the pieces that you need to put together in order to do this uh, and, and and you know just to test and see if there are bugaboos in the mathematics or or if you can do it now one complication is that these are not just wire meshes right they're 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 complexes so so you you have you have boundaries like uh, surfaces or triangles uh, uh, not just vertices uh, and edges, um, and and potentially you can you can do this at, at any dimension, um, and uh, I would argue that you use the annihilation version of the row calculus uh, to lift it to handle the to, to to get versions of the the approach I used in in uh, the Fano plane to to model complexes. Um, but uh, I haven't done those calculations, so you know it's it at right now it's just an intuition. Uh, but but that that so so now now to to, to put it all together, um, I, I'm arguing. Um, uh, so so in, initially I, I argued that uh, there there will be enough structure in quantum gravity to have a universal computer, and as a result. Uh, we could look for life, uh, like actually in space time itself, um, as well as, you know, in um, configurations of matter and energy. Um, and that this view is, is facilitated by a computational account of um, biological agency. And then I, um, I, I took a, another step in refining this perspective uh, you know, analyzing a, a sum of, you know, in, in a very, you know, small uh, new level of detail, 
the the perspective that Eric Smith and, and his colleagues um, get from life as effectively ge geochemistry far from equilibrium and observe that that in, in fact um, computational models of um, chemistry of that kind are feasible using stochastic versions of the um, of uh, 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 the the mobile process calculi, and that, uh, and then uh, and then taking another step to suggest that there is a, at least a um, a path worth investigating where you take um, process models of um, of discrete differential geometry uh, to give um, computational analogs of, um, of uh, uh, general relativity. Uh, and, and as a result, now you can analyze uh, the, the resulting models um, uh, using by simulation and look inside those models for arrangements that are bisimilar to, um, you know, processes that enjoy uh, metabolic and uh, uh, reproductive agency. So uh, let me just check in. D does that make sense? Yeah, I think I, I can follow. And uh, I, I would like to ask you, uh, from that perspective, uh, what does it mean to have enough structure? I mean, can we can we look at, uh, at the weather and in, on, on, on Earth and you know the climate and some kind of li living organism? Uh, uh, it is certainly possible. Yes, I mean it, it's 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 very. Uh, it, it seems to me unlikely that you have, you know, like let, let's say you look at a hurricane system. Um, I, I think I think you have notions of stability, but I don't think you have notions of of uh, um, metabolism and reproduction. Like you, and. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, this is this is what uh, yeah. What what did to ask you? What exactly do you mean by life? Um, you you're right. not you, you don't mean like conscious life in, in like right? Doesn't have to be right. I didn't say anything about consciousness. What, what, you know, I, I'm I'm starting I'm starting from you know um, bits and pieces that you know I can point to. Right, so so I, I you know I, I can I can point to metabolism, and I can give fairly convincing analogs, right? At, at, at least you know convincing enough that that it's it's worthwhile for more people to take a look. And 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 we can make this very precise, right? So to the the, the extent to which we find you know the Krebs cycle, um, you know, showing up in some form across all organisms. Um, and, and that's just chemistry. <laughs> and we can model all that chemistry with uh, stochastic process calculi. Um, that's totally reasonable, right? Um, and, but, and then we can, we can go beyond that. So we can, we can look at not just reproduction, but we can look at reproduction and the transmission of genetic information. And all of that is absolutely, you know, reasonably modeled in the process algebraic setting, right? So, so th these two basic aspects of life, uh, metabolic and re reproductive agency with, you know, the transmission of genetic information, um, that much we can certainly model. Now, is that life? Eh, you know, I think there's a lot of debate there, but, but the, 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 the point is that what, what we're showing is a methodology. Show me a property of life that you can calculate with, right? And then, and then I'll show you a method to translate it over into this other setting. And that this other setting has lots and lots going for it, which is why you want to use that setting. Right, you know, instead of using differential equations, let's use a, a, um, a formalism that's compositional <laughs> yeah, yeah. as an example, right? Instead of using differential equations, let's use a formalism where we have a notion of bisimulation. Let's use a notion where we have an, 
let's use a, a, a formalism that has a notion of substitutability. Let's use a formalism that has a notion of types and, and classification. <laughs> so all of these things are going for you in, in the mobile process setting that makes it, so it's, it's not just that it's feasible to move your calculations over into this domain, but that if you do, you get all these other advantages. Right, that's the that's kind of the point. So this means that life doesn't have to be um, with DNA, for example. I mean, doesn't have to be with the, the right, right. The, so the, yeah. the argument is once you have uh, one, once you have a computational account, there's no reason why we can't find uh, silicon-based life. And I don't mean silicon in the sense of computers, you know, wires and and uh, and bits, but but rather, you know, that the, the chemistry that is supporting the metabolic, reproductive, and and other uh, biological agency is based in silicon. I mean, the question is, for example, uh, I can ask: uh, Is my arm uh, alive? Yes. Like, it's, if someone is looking just my arm, is, is it alive? <laughs> it's, it's difficult to say, right? <laughs> you, you, you can ask those kinds of questions. And I think that the, you know, the, the computational answers would, would, would ultimately um, bear out a lot of our intuitions. By itself, the arm is not alive, right? If you excise the arm from, it, from its context in the body, it quickly dies. And it ceases to have the properties that we associate with life. For example, metabolic agency. Or, or I was thinking, uh, uh, if someone is, uh, if, if someone can only see my arm, uh, it, it will have a different perspective. So, so this is how I, I'm, I'm like, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, uh, it understanding observe, what you're saying. Yeah, it will observe that the arm is is uh, is somehow connected to a larger system that is. Uh, right, you know. and that that then goes back to Smith's point about looking at the biosphere, uh, right? Because heterotrophic, well, all of all of life, including the autotrophs, uh, seem to be interconnected, uh, right? E everything eats everything else. <laughs> I mean, the, the sun is also like it, it's it's uh, you know yeah well, it's yeah fuel and... yeah that's right that's right exactly um, so a, anyway I, I I mean to me this kind of research program has been um, just fa fascinating for a number of different reasons um, you know in particular I think it's it's it says you know how do I say this. We, we, we've started to see that um, quantum mechanics, uh, it, uh, that the computational perspective that, um, that was brought to quantum mechanics has begun to change the, 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 you know, the, the dialogue about physics. And this was something I, I pre predicted 20 years ago that, that um, you know, you, you, you know in, a, in a kind of cartoon way, um, uh, computation used to be kind of the, the, the water boy for science. You know, go and calculate this for me. I'm, I'm busy doing science and I'm too busy to do these calculations. You know, you computer go and do these calculations for me, right? Um, but that's going to change. In particular, computation it, as a perspective on you know how on mathematical reasoning and and in and, and general reasoning about physical processes is it's going to flip around and computation is going to change the way we do science and this is already happening so as an example Chiara Marletto and David Deutsch have proposed a different framework for doing physics um, so instead of expressing dynamical laws and, and uh, initial conditions, so laws of motion together with initial conditions, they propose that physical theories be expressed in terms of counterfactuals. So what transformations are possible and what transformations are not possible. 
And they make this proposition precisely because under the dynamical laws and initial conditions formulation, it's very difficult to give an exact formulation of information. Uh, information seems to be, you know, somehow only an emergent property and therefore not fundamental. Life is also uh, an emergent property and not fundamental. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, their argument is that, that uh, if you shift the physics away from dynamical laws and initial conditions to uh, um, uh, formulations in, in terms of counterfactuals, then you can account for uh, important phenomena that are properly the domain of physics, such as information. Um, so, so already we're seeing the shift in science towards, uh, you know, the, you know, imposed by, um, and, and sorry, so just to complete the argument, and a lot of, uh, you know, what they said was, was not just because of um, you know, the advent of computers, but, but the, the real impact that quantum computation has had on physics, right? So it, if, if there hadn't been quantum computation, it might have easily, and, and, and the impact that it is having on the on practicing physicists like Bob Kuka, um, uh, they, 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 there would have been less likely this kind of uh, uh, this kind of proposal from Deutsch and Marletto. Um, so, so, and and my argument is that this is where this is only just the beginning. Uh, that that uh, computation is going to over the next two hundred years, computation is going to fundamentally revise all of the physical sciences because of compositionality. Um, be, be, because of by simulation and so on. And so he, the, the proposals that I've talked about today have to do with um, uh, a, a, a exactly that, right? They, they allow us to, to change the way we view the world. So a world that is based on uh, dynamical laws and initial conditions that that perspective on the world is devoid of life. And if you grow generations and generations of humans thinking that life is not fundamental, then that might have an impact on how they view the world, right? So if you have centuries of humans thinking that life is not fundamental, that, that, that might subtly influence the kind of world they bring about. Um, you know, the, a, a world which is rapidly moving towards barren, towards this, you know, the sixth mass, mass extinction. Uh, that might have a play there. But if, if computation can show us, no, 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 life is fundamental, um, then I think we will, it, it is possible, at least in principle, to move towards a different relationship to the living world, so that we're not rushing headlong uh, towards mass extinction. Uh, so uh, with that, that's, that's where I would, I'll kind of uh, tie things up. We'll be nominating you for a Nobel Prize someday in the future. Right? <laughs> I doubt it very much. Yeah. And to me, it's not it's, the big prize would be if we can just build a coordination system and people use it so that we don't throw all of human culture out with the bathwater as the shit hits the fan. <laughs> that <laughs> yes. would be an amazing prize. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll see many. I have, I have one thought. Um, you mentioned UFOs in one of the climate uh, talks the other day, and the, the government is coming out 
with a lot of new uh, videos of UFOs, and you you just mentioned uh, life existing within space time itself. Uh, there's uh, there's been a theory that UFOs may be uh, li living organisms. Uh, there was a guy named Trevor James Constable. Ah. I mean, he was, uh, he's kind of in the esoteric and the occult, but he's always maintained that that most UFOs, uh, you know, most UFOs that we really couldn't identify and had some other substance to them were probably living organisms. And he's got one book called The Cosmic Pulse of Life and another one called They Live in the Sky. But anyway, I, I thought I would throw that in because there are two connections there that I that I'm sort of showing my roots now in in the uh, UFO uh, field. I, I I used to research that field quite a bit. Oh, interesting. That that's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, who who knows if they're extra if the phenomena that the 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 armed forces are reporting. Um, are extraterrestrial at all? I mean, just because they're they're um, you know they're unidentified aerial phenomena doesn't mean that they they come off planet. Um, they they might they might in fact be they they might in fact be terrestrial uh, or or as you say they might be organisms that are just you know using what's available in space time but in a way that we hadn't thought about before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great talk. Thank you, Greg. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'll see many of you and stand up in about 10 minutes. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.